All right. Y'all tune on in. Let me get my stuff back. Y'all tune on in. Let me tune on in. 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 All right. All right, all right. Y'all tune on in. Tune on in. Tune on in. Let me get straight here and let's get out of business. Apologize for the delay. Turn that yet. All right, all right. All right, turn that volume down over there, sir. Please. All right. Well, I'm a working man, so that's how it goes here. All right. We on Facebook Live. We on. Let's see. We over here going. Going live on YouTube. All right, we all the lives that we got. All right. One is brighter than the other. All right, all right. Y'all tune on in. Tune on in. And we are back again. Back again, back again. Apologize for the delay. But that's how it goes when you're in a law office. I had a conference call. And I'll tell you about my conference call that ran over. All right. Okay, y'all tune on in. I see you, Ari. I see you, Imam. I see you, Yusuf. I see y'all. Y'all tune on in. Because I'm coming back again for um, orientation. Close that door for me, Doc. Close that door, please. Orientation on legal rights and police training. Orientation number two. Started off on number one last time. Tune in, share it with your friends. Give me your attention. I won't be long, but I must be strong. I won't be longer than 45 minutes. I was trying to get my video straight. I played my video and then everything cut off. But um, I got the class. I got the attorney and I got the facts. That's the main thing in class that I'm here and I'm ready to teach. I do need technology. I need some administrative assistance with all of this stuff. And it's taking a little time because I want to be able to put the video right in and the caption right in. And I'm doing the best I can right now with what I know and what help I have. But one thing for sure, I want to tell you sisters and brothers who are right here, I am committed, fully committed to the operations of Shabazz University and also here at Black Lawyers for Justice, blackrightsmatter.org. Blackrightsmatter.org. I am fully committed to making sure that the classes run and we get the right education because that's the main thing when you're starting a teaching program or education that you have consistency. And so on an average work day, I put this in my schedule. Now let me apologize for being late because we ask all the professors at Shabazz University to be on time. And since I'm the dean, I have to set the example. Um, I made a missed schedule. I scheduled a conference call at one o'clock or 12 o'clock and the call just ran over and over, over and over and over. And um, I just couldn't get it all worked out, but here I am. My subject today is orientation part two. Orientation part two, know your rights and surviving police encounters. Know your rights and surviving police in town. How you doing, Keisha James, Brother Ozell from Hawaii? All of you inside of the United States of America. Najee Muhammad. That looked like Minister Najee Muhammad. And I want to say before I get going, thank you for the cufflinks. 
Thank you for the cufflinks in the name of Allah from the lost found nation of Islam given to me by Minister, Chief Minister Najee Muhammad. And I return the greetings to you and to the Honorable Silas Muhammad and the lost found members of the nation of Islam. Greetings to all of you. And I look for our work in the future. Thank you for the cufflinks. And to all of the nation of Islam, if you're under Minister Louis Farrakhan, whoever you under, if you're just a Muslim, Ramadan Mubarak. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakadu. Greetings, all of you. And to all of those who are in the listening and audience, if you're a civilian and you're on the airwaves, welcome. Welcome to Shabazz University. My name is Malik Shabazz. I'm teaching the class here today on part two orientation on legal rights here at the headquarters of Black Lawyers for Justice. Greetings to every civilian. Greetings to every mother who has, decides to let her son watch this video. Greetings to every sister who wants her brother or her cousins or her uncles or any male member to watch these videos. And certainly greetings to every black woman herself because the black woman is not a, 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 a absence at all from police brutality and police abuse. Say her name. Say her name. So this is for everybody. This is for the men. This is for the sons. This is for the soldiers. These are for the sisters. This is for the mothers. These are for the civilians who want to have a better understanding. You can close that door for me, please. Thank you so kindly. Have a, have a uh, better understanding of how to survive police encounters and to know your rights when dealing with the police. This is for all civilians. You may encounter the police on the street. You may encounter the police in your home. You may encounter the police on a traffic stop. You may be arrested. And I want to help you in all of those circumstances to know what you're dealing with know the laws that you're dealing with so that you can be effective. But you cannot be effective in knowing the law and dealing with the police in my judgment, in our judgment at Black Lawyers for Justice, unless you know who we are and unless you know the context in which we're applying the law. And I want to say, I was going to say so-called law, but it is the law. And it's the white man's law. It is what Khalid Muhammad called white law. Constitutional law, federal law, state law, white law. The criminal statutes that we'll discuss and whether you can be arrested under probable cause and so forth, these are criminal statutes under American law, and American law is what I call white law, and it is the law of the land. And so we're going to explore this. We want to go into what the Holy Quran says. Holy Quran say, obey those in authority, and Islam teaches that. But there's an exception after that. It says, obey those in authority unless it poses a conflict with your religion. So we're going to get into today the context of policing, and I'm going to come back to a very important point in a moment. It's called discipline. Discipline. Because everything that I'm going to discuss today from my book, Let, and my brochure, Knowing, Know Your Rights When Dealing with the Police. We talk about stop and frisk, traffic stops, Miranda rights, your rights with the police. I want to say before we get started that discipline is the number one lesson of today. It's discipline. Because I'm going to give you some revolutionary knowledge today, some, some information that will make you not want to obey the law will make you question the law. 
will make you question the law and question the lawmaker and question whatever they have to say about the lawbreaker. And so we're going to deal with discipline, the authority, whose authority, what authority, should we submit to this authority, and under what rules of submission. So let me recap a couple of points and we'll go a step further. I recap a couple of points because there are people that are on this class that are watching the class right now that did not attend last class. You all are just becoming acclimated with Shabazz University. You're just becoming familiar with Shabazz University. So I teach current, but then I go back a little bit and I take us forward here in this summer orientation session. Again, ShabazzUniversity.com is here to stay. We will not be retreating. We're on here today. I'm on every Thursday. Me or one of our attorneys at Black Lawyers for Justice. On Sundays, there are parenting classes at 6 p.m. taught by the school board member, the Honorable Lois Long. Starting next Thursday here at 4 o'clock will be Reverend and Professor Frank Malone, who will be certifying black fathers in fatherhood training here Thursdays at 4 o'clock. It starts next Thursday here on my Facebook, here on ShabazzUniversity.com, here on YouTube, ShabazzUniversity.com. And we want you to subscribe to that YouTube channel as we build the audience and we stay committed to what we don't have, nobody has it. A university and a learning center where the masses of our people in America and around the world can tap into and tune into and learn what they need to learn for what we're teaching here, which is number one, nation building and survival skills. Nation building, and survival skills. And today we're certainly talking about survival when we talk about knowing your rights. We have an online university. Many, many professors are coming on board. Nobody, I want to say, has yet to give this to the people. The Shabazz University we're going to give an online consistent university to the people and we will die before we fail in the mission. And we will get stronger and better and more organized every week. But there will be no turning around because we are sick and tired of hearing you complaining at meetings and giving a bunch of suggestions and nothing come to pass. Well, you say, well, we need to. Well, we need to. We hear it at every meeting. We see it on the forum. What we should be doing is, and you know the other races, the yellow, the brown, the red, the other people look at us and they shake their head at a people that are constantly proposing solutions, but they never carry them out. But it is the job of leadership and those who say that they are over these organizations to produce these institutions that serve the wants and desires of the people. It is not to be blamed on the people. It is the leadership. It is the leadership of Black Lawyers for Justice. It is the leadership of the new Black Panther Party. It is the leadership of, uh, for these purposes, the National Bar Association, the largest association of Black attorneys to provide the solution. It is, the, it is on the leadership of Minister Louis Farrakhan to provide solution. It is on him. It is on Minister Silas Muhammad. It is on uh, uh, everybody. Mustafa Al-Ansari, the American Institute of Human Rights, the leadership of the Moors. It is on every so-called leader out there, every leader out there, to move beyond rhetoric and to provide institutions that can serve our people. Our people have heard enough uh, uh, reactionary rhetoric. They have heard enough running off at the mouth. And so I'm all about business here. At ShabazzUniversity.com, is not only online and reaching all over the world, but it's gonna be live in person teaching young men and young women in a few weeks. In a few weeks, you'll see me with young men. You'll see me with young women. You'll see our sisters, pardon me, our sisters with young women teaching them rites of passage. And so my last announcement is you'll see Imam Akbar, who will be coming on in a week or so, and he starts what? 
Islamic studies from a black perspective. Islamic studies from a black perspective has added into the lineup. All right, that's my intro. That's our purpose. That's why we're here. This is our what we're doing. My name is Malik Shabazz. I'm an attorney here, graduate of Howard Law School, an attorney here in the field of civil rights and constitutional rights. Okay, other fields I cover here on my desk. Personal injuries and all of that but none pertain to the lives of my people are as important to me as the police cases. And when we look at the shooting of uh, 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 the shooting and the killing and the murder of Alton Sterling and the murder of Mike Brown and the murder of Philando Castile and the murder of Sandra Bland and the murder of some of my own clients here. I got autopsy reports here on the floor. I'm in the thick of this battle. I'm not just talking from an outside perspective. The autopsy reports, the death reports of black men killed by the hands of either police or jailed officials are on my desk. Oh, no good District of Columbia. The District of Columbia. Election time. Attorney Carl Racine is running for elect re-election in the district. He wants your vote, citizen of the District of Columbia, the Attorney General. But I want to let you know uh, that the Attorney General of the District of Columbia, let me find this file here. The Attorney General of the District of Columbia has never hesitated, has never hesitated to fight the citizen that's voting for him to deny that citizen their right to be free from police abuse, unwanted seizures, arrests, brutality and harassment, that Carl Racine, the Attorney General in the District of Columbia, that he is the enemy of those rights. He is the enemy of the plaintiff. He is the enemy of the police victim. And I want you to be aware of that, those who are watching in the district and planning to cast your vote, because there is a political context as well. The Office of the Attorney General and the Army of Attorney and the millions of dollars or resources are designed to beat down and to destroy the plaintiff, to attack the plaintiff, and to take the few lawyers that are fighting police cases out here and to overwhelm them and to bombard them with a force that has superior resources. So be goddamn if you go out there and vote for another attorney general who is nothing more than a rubber stamp for the racist ex, uh, then the ex clan and military police that are roaming the district of Columbia. All right. So now the context of, of, of the class here of policing again, last week we discussed that police is a, uh, uh, come from a, a, a origin, a, a Latin word, a medieval Latin word, uh, uh, politia, politia, which means uh, uh, citizenship and government. And from politia comes police, the French and the English word, which means police or public order comes about in the late 15th century. Police or public orders, French and English, but it comes from the Latin politia. All right? And it sounds nice, as we said before. Sounds nice. And my staff, they always bailing out. They bailing out when I get distracted, but I'll get them. Anyway, um, um, police and security it's something that we're familiar with. Is that right? You're a fruit of Islam. You're a nation of Islam. You're familiar with security and police, and you believe in security and police. You're New Black Panther Party. You believe in security, police, searching, and making sure that it's a secure environment. 
you in the RNA, you in any black nationalist, pan-Africanist format. Uh, you say you in self-determination format. You say you believe in policing, self-policing. We should patrol and control our own communities. We have to police ourselves because we can't depend on the racist police officers of the United States. So we believe in security. We believe in safety for our families, our queens, our babies, our community, our elders. We believe in it, but we are completely dissatisfied with who is policing us and say that we want a society or a system of our own where we would police ourselves. That is our teaching because we are being policed right now and we're being asked to obey. We're being asked to comply. We're being asked to be good citizens. We should be good citizens and keep our affairs in order. Now to my conservative people who are amongst you, we can agree on some of that as well. Even inside of this colonial context, because I want you to be clear before we go forward, we are policing inside of a colonial context. We are a colonized people. And the colonizer, our former slave master, and our current colonizer, and I have to be honest, our current oppressor, white people of America, and white leadership of America is who is policing us and telling us to obey. And they are saying to us, citizen, you must obey these rules and these laws or otherwise you're going to go to jail. You must conduct yourself in a certain way or otherwise you're going to meet what? Reasonable suspicion. And if I reasonably suspect that you have committed a crime, I have a right to what? Detain you. I have a right to stop you. I have a right to frisk you. I have a right to uh, 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 see based on my uh, articulation of supposed specific facts, supposed that I have a right to detain you. I have a right to put your Fourth Amendment rights on hold, your rights to be free from seizure. I have a right as an officer, American officer, to put that on hold, to search you, to detain you. And I'm asking you to obey as a citizen. I'm asking you to submit to, uh, if I'm an officer, I'm asking you to submit to the arrest procedure. I have probable cause. I'm asking you to come with me willingly and not resist. I'm asking you, ex-slave, colonized person, current citizen of America, supposedly made a citizen and have the rights of the 14th Amendment, I'm asking you to obey because in this context, I am the white authority in America. Now, I want to be honest with you. When I, when, I, when I approach it this way, I don't know another way to approach it but to tell you the truth. This is the white man's police system. I don't care how many black police officers put on that uniform every day. This is the white man's police system. It's the white man's structure. It's the white man's governed country. And then they will issue you a uniform, issue you a badge as a black officer and put you out there on, on the street. But you're out on the street under white law. You are not policing under black law. You are policing under white law. And white law, constitutional law, white law, as Khaled Muhammad teaches us, constitutional law as reminded by Johnny Cochran and others. It's the law of the land. We are held captive here inside of the hills of North America. We are a captive people. And many of these laws and rules that we're going to go over today and in the weeks to come, they are rules for prisoners of war. They are rules for a colonized people. They are rules for a captured people. And there are rules, I must be honest with you, that a revolutionary is not satisfied with and that a revolutionary really seeks to overthrow and to remove.
and replace it, as the Bill of Rights says, with a system of justice after so many years of transgressions and usurpations and tyranny. I want to be clear, whatever law I'm discussing to you here, I'm giving it to you as a survival law, not because I necessarily believe in it. I'm an attorney at law here at this table to try to defend somebody, to prosecute somebody's case, to try to get justice in a federal court, get justice in a state court, get justice for somebody in a criminal court. But I have to be honest with you, I'm just going through the motions. I'm just a revolutionary out here putting on a suit and a tie and learning these rules and laws and going by these procedures. I'm doing it only to help my people. I'm just doing it to serve my people and do what I was taught at Howard University. I do not believe it is our ultimate goal. I do not believe that that courthouse is my courthouse. That is a courthouse of white supremacy ran by judges in a white supremacist tradition. I don't care if it's a black man with the roll bone. He's a black man with the roll bone in a system of white supremacy, uh, enforcing white supremacist laws in a system that has placed white people over us as conquerors. And we now as citizens, so-called citizens, really oppressed people, colonized people, and we're asked now to obey. And so let's see what they what the rules and the laws are so we can see how to survive so we can do what? Stop the killing as we move towards self-determination, as we move towards Kujichagulia, as we move towards reparations, as we move towards a separate status, sovereignty, rules, laws, police of our own, a nation of our own. I'm just here to help you survive as a brother just here to help you survive and to share with you so that we can survive and thrive and combat the most persistent and glaring injustice that society is perpetuating on us on a regular basis, and that is the police killing and harassment of us. The police falsely arresting and stopping and frisking us without cause. Let's get into it. Now, And one last point on this, you know, this so-called crime thing, you know, and we come up on election year, it's election year, it's election in Newark, it's election in Washington, D.C. coming up. And all the citizens, you know, Brother Akbar, they say, well, we want, we want better police. You know, you go to every meeting, here we out here fighting the police in every citizen form. We want more police. We want better policing. We, we want more. He's a mom openly on the streets. You know, it sounds like an Uncle Tom argument. But on the other hand, the problems in the black community, we have to take a look at it. My first subject in the pamphlet booklet, Know Your Rights. Those of you who picked it up, thank you. Follow along with me for the next couple of weeks. Those of you who need my booklet, you can email me now at attorney.shabazz, attorney.shabazz, S-H-A-B as in black, A-Z-Z at yahoo.com. This is my 2013 book that called What Black People Need to Know When Dealing with the Police. And these are the last few months you'll see this. I have an updated version coming. But if you email me, I'll give you a free copy, no charge, because I want you to have it and share. The first subject is avoid encounters with the police. The first subject, when the book come up, is avoid encounters with the police. Stay the hell away from the police. As a general rule and practice as a black person, you must try at all costs to avoid the police. Avoid unless absolutely necessary, unless you are risking jail or death yourself, stop calling the police. Let's just get in there, right in, in there. Stop calling the police. 
We can't go by this fairy tale. You know, they, they out here in the different police is having these different meetings and community meetings and precinct meetings and 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 they try to make all nice with the community. Let's come together and they have these meetings all over America in all different kind of towns and counties, these little meetings with the police. We want better policing. Okay. Since I'm since I haven't provided that police force, just let's just argue against me for a minute. Since I as a as a black panther have not provided a police force, since I hypothetically the nation of Islam, I have not provided a police force. Since I black community have not provided a police force, I cannot go now and crush the grandmama or the mother who's at the police precinct at this so-called meeting asking for better policing. However, still as a rule for whoever you are, grandmama, civilian, all of us, we have to stop calling the police unless it's absolutely necessary. The police are not our friends. White and black. They are not our friends. Let's, I say this here, I say avoid negative encounters with the police, which basically means avoid the police. Stop getting in scenarios and circumstances where you know the police are about to come on you or you got to call the police or you got to explain anything to the police because the statistics prove that you are headed for trouble in almost any encounter that you are not going to come up to win. Let's talk about domestic situation for a minute. We have to cut down, sisters and brothers, on domestic situations where the police are called. We have to cut down and cut out calling the police in domestic situations. Black women, we want to know when you call the police on that man. Did you call the police on that man out of necessity or did you call the police on that man out of emotion and anger? And was there a true need? Was there a sincere need? need to call that police or did you call it out of anger? The email is attorney.shabazz. I hear you, James Simmons. Attorney.shabazz at yahoo.com. Attorney.shabazz is yahoo.com. That's how I give you the booklet. Brother Bomani says we're dealing with police repression and governmental terrorism under Mayor Raz Barak. That must be from Newark. Okay. Well, that's something we're going to, I may not get into it today, but we have to get into it. Policing under, again, black mayors and so forth. How's policing going under black mayors? The same as it goes under black mayor Muriel Bowser. It hardly goes any different. Maybe worse because it's not the white man in power. Back to the domestic situation. Black woman, do you really have to call the police? Let's get into it. Only, only my sister, if you are facing serious bodily injury or death, do you need to be calling the police on a black man who is inside your home? Only if you're facing a physical threat that is real and not imaginary should you resort to calling the police. I know that's tough on some of you, but you we have to get into it. Domestic dispute have two sides to it. Every black man that's watching can empathize, empathize with this. 
if you're a black man and a black woman have not called the police on you at some point, I'd be wanting to say you might not even be a real black man. That's how this situation go down. Name one brother who was on this class, in the class right now, that can tell me two things. Name one black man that can say I've never been arrested. I bet 95% of you cannot say that. And name another that can say that I've never had the police called on me. All right, so I'm not going totally into that. I'm dealing with the principle of discipline and knowing how to stay away from the police and knowing what not to say to the police. I'm not teaching on a class on domestic relations today. I'm only touching on domestic relations on how to, re how to retain what? Discipline. Discipline. And to know how to not let our emotions get the best of us, our feelings, our hatred against each other to get the best of us so that we can reduce police encounters and then try to manage the police encounters from a level of reduced police encounters. Not managing this wild circus we got right now. The police running around everywhere. There's no man on the scene. Nine times out of the 10, it's a black woman on the phone line calling the police because a child is out of control, a so-called man is out of control. And so the first word out here is discipline. And I'm gonna come back and touch on the domestic and the other areas where discipline is required, okay? Coming right back to this domestic situation, but I wanna get into discipline. Discipline is, I'll get all my graphics straight and my boards and all that straight. I'm going for it today. I'm teaching regardless. Discipline is the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior using punishment to correct disobedience. It's the discipline is the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior using punishment to correct disobedience. Discipline is also a branch of knowledge, typical one studied in higher education. This is a, a discipline I'm teaching you today. This is a certain field or a branch of knowledge called legal knowledge pertaining to police issues, constitutional issues. This is a discipline. But also discipline is a noun. It's also a verb also. But it's a noun, uh, 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 it, is, it is a practice of training people to obey. And that's what I want to get across to you today, that we all, on your notepads, must have discipline. Inside of the black community, the black nation, no matter what your position on the police is, we must have greater discipline. We must have greater discipline with our mouths. We must have greater uh, 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 discipline with our minds. We must have much, much greater discipline on how we deal with each other to, to cut down on police encounters, okay? We must have restraint. So you're in the month of Ramadan, right? Ramadan urges restraint. You smell that good food. You want to eat right away. But there's a law on you says restraint. A law on you that prohibits that. And even though you may not like it, when you submit to that law, your body, your mind, you become what? More disciplined. Because you underwent Ramadan and Ramadan told you what to do and what not to do. Or you came under Elijah Muhammad. He told you when to eat and when not to eat. What to eat, when not to eat. Discipline. You cannot even dream of dealing with the police force of the United States of America without having discipline. Discipline is number one for the civilian, number one for the organization, 
Number one for our interaction with each other is discipline, self-control, mental control, physical control, so that we'll know what to do and what not to do, what to say and what not to say. Now let's look at discipline in the context of police encounters and how to avoid police encounters. You in the you in the home with your you in let's say this is the woman's resident. She's in control of the resident. This is her house or apartment. And you're over there, brother. You are visiting over there. Woman go on your cell phone. You fall asleep. Woman go in, black woman, your queen, your wife, or whoever. Go on your cell phone. Find these texts of you and you and Rashida. You and Rashida have been texting and exchanging pictures. You knocked out. Oh, but she's in your cell phone. And when next thing you knew, she was upside your head. Damn, upside your head. When you woke up. You know, woke up, she got your phone, you busted. She's going in on your ass. Black man. What do you do? You got a you got suits in the closet. You got some of your stuff over there. She says, nigga, this is the last time. She's going off on you about everything. The woman, the job, the kids, she's unloading on you verbally. Even throwing some things at you. She take a knife. Let's say the black woman took a knife and went to the closet. And you had a cool $700 Armani pinstripe suit in the closet. She say, nigga, this is the last time I catch you with Rashida. And she went to your suit, stabbed into your suit, ripped your Imani suit up. What do you do, black man? You say, I'm tearing into her ass. Going after my, I'm going into her ass is what you say. Brother, discipline. Now, this is going to require some discipline. And you must exercise it. Because if you don't exercise that discipline, you're going to have to take the rest of this class. And it's going to be called your right to remain silent after being arrested. Because if the police come, and many times they are, your side of the story ain't going to mean nothing. So the best advice I can give you to avoid the police off the bat in a domestic situation is no matter what she's saying to you, no matter what she's doing to you, get the hell out of the house. Get the hell out of the environment and deal with that later. Run. Warning. Run. Get out of the house and get out of Dodge. You can replace the Imani suit, but you cannot replace your life. Avoid a situation where you will have to put hands on that woman. Avoid it at all costs. She cutting your suit. She breaking this. She breaking your furniture. Broke your phone. So goddamn what? Get the hell out of the house and avoid the police. Because the moment you retaliate, 9 or before, 9 he hit me, he beat me, you're on your way to jail. Get the hell out. Let's reverse the situation and make it worse. She fell asleep and you went in her phone. She fell asleep, you went in her telephone. And you seen her in Lumumba, Lumumba Muhammad, texting away, flirting away. 
You've been taking care of this woman. You've been doing all you can. This woman has now clearly betrayed you in this phone. Your anger level rises, rises. Like any man's would, you are pissed, you're hurt. And then you get to arguing with the woman and then she say something to you that really pissed you off. She put you down or she went to some core point that really set you off. Should you take matters into your own hand and teach her a lesson? No, sir, don't do it. Please don't, please don't do it. I'm asking you, brothers, please don't do it. Avoid your ultimate enemy. Because if you got to deal with that, you don't want to deal with that anyway. The hell you want to argue about if you really want to deal with that? Do you really want to deal with that? Get the hell out of Dodge, black man. No matter how great the insult is, when you see your red flag coming, this is an anger management principle. When you see when your red flag and you know your red flags and when you know your triggers, avoid your triggers, avoid your red flag, get out, walk, cool off, abandon the set. We have all had domestic encounters that we wish we would have left the scene. For all sons and future generations, no matter what happened with the black woman or any of our sisters, don't put your hands on them. Get the hell out of Dodge. Even if they hit you, get the hell out of Dodge. I don't see them hurting you. Let them punch all goddamn day. Get the hell out of Dodge. You'll survive. Avoid police encounters. That's the first lesson in the booklet avoid police encounters you with your boys let's come out of the home because again in the domestic encounter how many of you experienced this you ain't even touched a woman no calls for no police she's on the phone why because you called her a bitch or you said she was ugly you said something that went to her trigger point. She right on the phone. I'm gonna call the man on you. No, nigga, you think you bad, nigga. I'm gonna call the man on you. When they say the man, the means that the is the, uh, uh, the standardizes and epitomizes that which is about to describe the man. When she picks up that phone and says, I'm gonna call the man on you, she means, nigga, I'm going to call the white man on you. You think you bad black man, but nigga, I got a man that's going to put you in line. I'm calling the man on you. And many times when she calls the man on you, it's not because you have violated the law. It is because in some way you have become, according to her view, in need of being checked. And she is going to call the highest checking force that she knows the white man in the person of the police department in the city or the county of america so you could just insult a woman and she will be on that phone he beat me he hit me so on so forth 911 and here come a goddamn army around the corner coming to the door if it's her home when they get to the door, it's her home. No warrant needed. She can let them right on in. If it's your home, a warrant would be needed unless there's evidence that a felony or violence is being committed at that time. So then here the police, they come looking in the door in the entryway, looking for a further reason to get in. You don't want to go through none of that. When you see her heading in that direction, when you see her saying she gonna do that or picking up that phone, whether it's her fault or your fault or just a bit misunderstanding, brother, abandon the goddamn scene. Abandon the scene. 
Here's another scenario. That's domestic relations. By all means, final rule, by all means, abandon the scene and avoid physical contact regardless to your physical being injured or destruction of your property. You will survive all of that. Get the hell away from the police. Now, other context before we move forward. Just regular interactions between black men in the community. Well, the police was out here today. Police here, police there. Why? It's because Taekwon and Janelle is out there fighting. Taekwon pulled a gun on Janelle. Uh, uh, Taekwon hit Janelle. Um, so forth. Anger management. Anger management one-on-one. -on -one. Brothers, men, before we go forward, black men, before you get into hitting another black man, taking a punch at another brother, before you get into that, before you reach for the waistband, Can discipline, can discipline is what we want to ask. Can discipline prevail? Can discipline prevail, black man? This is orientation to police rights, surviving police encounters. The first orientation you got to know is don't encounter them. Because then you get into Every encounter that don't go our way, Mike Brown, uh, uh, every one of them that I've named, Alton Sterling, all of them, everyone you name, the level of success, the level of success once you encounter the police goes down and down. If you're going to teach this class in the black community, and police training and teach these classes and repeat these classes and work with me to teach these classes yourself. Anger management and the ability to say no to harming another brother must be number one. You know, I'm not going to get into it with that brother because I'm going to end up going to jail if I knock this nigga out. That's what you, th you have to think in your mind. If this nigga piss me off, and I'm gonna kill, like I'm gonna kill you think in your mind, like I'm finna kill this nigga for what this nigga did. But then you gotta ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth these police I'm about to encounter? Is what that black man said or did to me or said or did to somebody else is in fact this worth this police encounter? Can I take a deep breath? Can I breathe deep? Can I count to 10? And to see whether this war against my black brother is necessary. This is what the black community need to know. And I can't even say that you as conscious people are so much better because you fighting it out on the internet as much as the brothers fighting it out on the streets. And it seemed like many of your verbal internet encounters would lead to a physical fist fight on the street if the black conscious who's fighting the black Muslim who's fighting the other black Hebrew, if the words was taken offline onto the street, you would be out there fighting as well. So I won't go all into conflict resolution today, but I must say that anger management, temper reduction, discipline, the ability to control what we say and how we bring actions to each other is a great weapon against encountering the police. Let us keep the police out of our affairs. Let us keep them off of our blocks. Let us keep them out of our homes. Let us keep them out of our neighborhoods. And only if absolutely and strictly necessary would that call be made. 
and probably that call will be made so you could avoid actually taking matters in your hands to such a strong way where you will be off the street. All right? Now, um, discipline, boy, time flies. Discipline comes into play with the police in terms of speaking to law enforcement. One of our main deficiencies is talking too much. We talk too much. And we talk too much when we encounter the police. We've all heard the statement, you have a right to remain silent. Anything that you say can and will be used against you, but nobody practices it. That's Miranda, your Miranda rights. And the key Supreme Court case that says you don't have to speak to an attorney at all. You don't have to speak unless you have your attorney. You don't have to speak at all to law enforcement or to anyone unless your attorney is present. And you really don't have to speak at all, all the way through trial. You don't have to say nothing. How many of us practice it? So let's just stay on Miranda. If you happen to be arrested, if you happen to be arrested, and uh, after and even being detained after a certain amount of time in detention or being detained or stopped by the police, it converts to an arrest. Arrest means to be held against your own will by the force of law. Okay, and then you have whether it's a legal arrest or it's a false arrest. That's what we're battling about now in this office. All right, but still, I want to emphasize loose lips sink ships. That's the first advice your attorney going to give you. Stop talking. When the, Don't think that you can talk your way out of it with the police. The police and detectives design the program and design their interrogation to convince you that they're going to do you a favor if you start talking and give them information and verily, they are only trapping you. Verily that your statements can and will be used against you and they always are. You're not gonna win in, an, in a back room or on a side or on a police car talking with the police, going on record, getting them to record your statements and to thinking you're going to talk your way out of it. 99 times out of 100, any criminal lawyer will tell you that you have talked yourself into a hole. Exercise your right to remain silent if arrested. You do not have to talk to the police, period. You do not have to speak with the police unless you are being uh, still officially detained. And then only then under certain states do you have to show ID if you are being detained. But overall with the police departments, how you doing? Where are you going? I don't have to answer you. There's no law. It says I have to answer a police officer to ask me where I'm going unless I'm going somewhere prohibited. If I'm walking down the street and I have the right to walk down the street, you cannot ask me where I'm going. I don't have to talk to you. You must detain me. If you're going to detain me to stop me and to question me as, as to uh, the suspicion that I may have committed a crime, then that's different. So again, stop talking to the police. Stop giving up ID to the police. Stop allowing searches in your vehicle and of your person to the police. Can I search your car? No, you may not. I have done nothing wrong, but no, you may not.
Imam Akbar says to demand to know what you're being charged with. Well, you have to be charged. Once you have to be arrested first. If you are arrested and taken in, then you can ask what you're being charged with. Although we want to cut down on all that conversation. If you're being held, the question is, if you're being detained, the question is, am I free to no? Am I free to leave? Am I free to leave will let you know whether you're being held for questioning. If a police officer is questioning you, this is write this down. That's what I want you to know today if you don't take nothing else. If a police officer is questioning you, just stops to question you. They have a right to do that, but they have to have what's called a reasonable suspicion. All right. And so the case that I will um, that is in the book and that we'll touch on today and come back for a full class on next week is Terry v. Ohio. Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, Terry v. Ohio. This is a case that deals with the Fourth Amendment and the rights of a police officer to seize you, which means to hold you against your will, which is a restriction on your Fourth Amendment right, the rights of that officer to seize you, and under what circumstances may he hold you against your will in order to conduct what? An investigatory stop to investigate whether or not a crime has been committed. Terry v. Ohio teaches us that the Constitution prohibits stops. It prohibits seizures absent reasonable suspicion that criminal activity is afoot, and it requires more than a suspicion. Okay, so just say a police officer now stops you and is questioning you about a so-called crime. He has to have what's called reasonable suspicion. And this is often where police officers abuse the law. Let's go to a case I got here right now. I got a, uh, I got a case here that I'm working on. Um, a motion for summary judgment against the District of Columbia. It's um, Jamal Robinson. It's a public case. It's Jamal Robinson versus the District of Columbia and officers in the gun recovery unit. Okay, and so what the gun recovery unit does is, like in many cities, there are a, a pack of officers that drive around looking for guns and really the officers in the gun recovery unit main mission is to see whose body and whose pockets that they can search. That is their main mission. And their main mission is to get around the fourth amendment to get around Terry V Ohio and to get into your pockets and to get on your body to see what they can find claiming that you may have a weapon. Now, let's look at my case and to show you how this is abused and how we should respond to it. Mr. Jamal Robinson. Now, this case, he's the, uh, the victim or he's the plaintiff or he's you. He is a former police officer who is a black man who came to me and he had his badge he had his gun. He was off duty going to pick up his child. The police and the gun recovery unit beset on him, detained him, arrested him. And even though they um, found out shortly after he was handcuffed that he was an officer and he did have a gun, yet they did not relent. So the serious situation goes like this. Mr. Robinson is leaning on the wall. This is say this is a wall. The front, oh, he's on this public sidewalk now. And there's a wall that separates the property from the sidewalk. And there's a house that is a abandoned 
that is a house that says it's abandoned. It's got a no trespassing sign on the house. Robinson is on the sidewalk. He's not committing any law. He's violating any law. He's not committing any violation. He's not trespassing at all. The gun recovery unit rolling around the city. The gun recovery unit sees two African-American males and using this justification that this is a so-called high crime area, even though they really can't prove it in this case. And so their mission is to stop any suspicious black male and reasonable suspicion for the average white officer and the gun recovery unit is the fact that you black and you look suspicious is what's called the current state of reasonable suspicion that leads to stop and frisk and detainments. You are black and you in a certain neighborhood, that's enough to get you stopped, held and frisked, but that is a violation. So Mr. Robinson, they ask is anybody have any weapons and mr robinson says yes i have a weapon and i'm an officer immediately boom they move to tackle him they move to tackle him and they subdue him and within two or three minutes after that they have pulled his wallet out seen he's an officer that he's a valid police officer and that his weapon is a weapon that he has a right to carry in the District of Columbia. Do they let him go? Hell no, they didn't let him go. That's what they should have did. That's why they're in court right now. Because even if the judge agree that they had a, a, a reasonable suspicion to stop him, which they didn't, which they did not, God damn it, you held him too long. Because once you get, once you investigate whether a stop, whether or not the person has committed a crime, and once you know as a police officer that a crime has not been committed, then what? You have to let the man go. And the right question to ask after you've been questioned by a police officer and is, am I free to leave? If you're not free to leave, then you're being detained. If you're not free to leave after they have ran your name and so forth, then you have in fact been arrested, but you must ask the question and should ask the question, am I free to leave? And that officer who has been trained knows what that means. You should ask that question right off the bat. Am I free to leave? Because if they say you are not free to leave, then you are under an investigatory stop and the rules of Terry v. Ohio apply. But even if you're under an investigatory stop, they cannot hold you forever. They cannot drag it out forever. You have to find out whether the man is wanted for a crime or not, or whether there's probable cause to arrest the man, or you have to raise up off the man. And this is what you need to be if you're going to say anything at all, which I don't advise. But if you're going to say anything at all, you must say, am I free to leave? Or are you going to arrest me? And is there probable cause to arrest me? When you use these terms, when you use these terms, police will know that you know what they know and they will handle you differently. They will handle you differently. So now let's look at the, in this case, I'm telling you about, then I got to end, unfortunately. And I'm going to come right back next week. If you want to get introductory material, you have to study the first two classes. Next week, I'm going right into stop and frisk. The, the subject today is discipline and how it relates to stop and frisk. Discipline in two aspects, in terms of restraint, also discipline into learning a field. In this class, we want to learn these rights and laws and make it a code of conduct in the community so that everybody is on the same page and so that a lot of people know their rights and the police begin to know that swaps 
and whole branches of the community now know their rights and are operating differently. I'm coming to your questions. In my case that I'm fighting the district on and aiming to win, they lied. The, the police and the officers are blatantly lying. They say that a man who's on a public sidewalk leaning on a wall that a house of a house that has a yard and that the house has a trespassing sign on that merely for the man leaning on the wall that that is a sign that a crime may have been committed. That that is a, 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 a reasonable suspicion to investigate. Hell no. That's racial profiling. That's racial profiling. The man is not violating the law. He is not on the property. He have not entered the property. He ain't even in the yard. And every criminal, every crime and every criminal charge, you must have intent, even if he was in the yard. If he went to chase a basketball or something in the yard of that house, it is in your intent to trespass, and the law on trespass say you got to go in the goddamn door of the house. You got to crack that door. But yet they're arresting him on suspicion of trespass because it wasn't even about the trespass. This was the gun recovery unit and they thought they had a man with a gun, but they found out he was a cop and they got pissed because they did not have him and because he stood up to them verbally and therefore they held him for over an hour because they were angry and they wanted to show him who was boss and when those cops got angry is when they violated the law and when they put themselves in legal jeopardy of being sued and now compensating that man. This man is going to be compensated for that one hour that he spent uh, being held. That one hour he was falsely charged. I don't give a damn what the government and Carl Racine and his lawyers say. Carl Racine and his lawyers are hit men against the human rights of the people. The attorney general, the state prosecutor, they are hit men against the rights of the people. You should drive all of them out of office. And damn it, they won't win this. And I don't care who the judge is on the bench. This don't even fit white law. Lying to give cause to reasonable suspicion. Lying saying that the man was trespassing and there's no evidence that he was even anywhere, nowhere near trespassing racial profiling, and you're going to pay. And you're going to pay behind the efforts of black lawyers for justice and attorney Malik Shabazz and others. Now, um, let me answer some questions. And next week, I'm going to go well, let me make sure I cover discipline in different areas. When you're stopped by the police, let me wrap on this, conclude. When you're stopped by the police on the street, unless they, unless they say you're not free to leave, keep it moving. High officer and by, gone. If you're being questioned, the, the answer, the, if you're being questioned or stopped, the question is, am I free to leave? If you're not free to leave, then you know you are being detained. If you're being detained, you don't have to say anything. If you're being demanded after being detained, after being detained, not before, then you can produce that identification and nothing more. Once they find out that you are not that person that's being wanted for that arrest, then the detention must end. 
and you must again say, am I free to leave? If not, and they have found, and they have taken a reasonable amount of time, normally it's 15 minutes. Then it is converting to an arrest. An arrest requires probable cause. All right, now, let me go to the questions, y'all. Thanks for bearing with me. Let me go on these questions. I'm going to take questions in the class. And then next week, I'm going to come back and we're going to go into page four of my book, Rules for Not Losing Your Cool When Stopped by the Police. And we're going to go into section six, Stop and Frisk and Racial Profiling. I'll get back later to the whole domestic law and all of that. I touched on that today just for the subject of discipline. All right. So if you will email me at attorney.shabazz at yahoo.com, attorney.shabazz at yahoo.com, I'm going to get you again my booklet, What Black People Need to Know When Dealing with the Police. And I'll give out the materials for next week, which will include an analysis of Terry v. Ohio and updates to brothers who are out in the community and who encounter the police and the police are jacking them up. I'll go all into that. That'll be the specific subject. I'm going right into it next week. Okay, now let's go on to the questions here. Thank y'all for attending. This is kind of a, a unusual legal class because it's legal, but it's social and cultural and political because you can't have one without the other. All right. Now let's go to the questions. Hey, Darlene, Shamanda, uh, Bobby Worthy, Bobby Worthy, you know this stuff. We got to teach this brother all over, all over America. The reason why I'm here is not just for you to tune in here. It's make me look like some kind of big shot. I'm here to help empower you. I'm here to encourage you all to take facts and law and to take it in your study circles, take it in your family circles, take it in your schools, take it in your home, and to take what I'm teaching and reduplicate that teaching. And I'm just here to back you up as an attorney and with other attorneys. All right, bear with me. Amir Africa Sankofa, these names got me laughing. <laughs> uh, Kamal, thank you. You're welcome, brother. I'm doing the best I can. James Simmons, kill them with kindness. Okay, you're making a point. It's not bad to deceive your enemy if you're a soldier. It's not bad to deceive your enemy. I consider myself a frontline 100% revolutionary who dress in the disguise of a lawyer when I need to go to court or carry out a certain action. I can go in there and be as congenial as I can be. Good morning, Judge and Mr. Prosecutor. No, and I don't give a damn about the prosecutor. Don't even like him. Good morning to defense counsel. Knowing that defense counsel is a no good bastard. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I keep it all professional. Let's get down to business. I'm here to get to my main point, not to get caught up with you. When you're dealing with the police, it's not a, it's not bad. You don't have to let all of your feelings out. I know it looked good and bold. Police stop you. Man, fuck you, officer. Fuck you. I mean, you get points for boldness, and I might give you a black hand just for cussing them out. But that would not be my strategic advice to you. I remember this is a good story for you as I conclude. In 1998, when we were leaving Dallas, Texas to drive to Jasper, Texas, and the new Black Panther Party continue, contingent, I'm the attorney, 
Khalid Muhammad is the leader of the mission. There was about 30 Black Panthers, new Black Panthers, and seven cars. We were being monitored at the bookstore. And as soon as we pulled off in a line of vehicles to take this three hour ride to Jasper, Texas, woo, here come the police pulling all of the Panthers over. And I mean, all of us is armed to the teeth. And the hell if I know who weapon is valid, who not, who got a warrant, who does it? One of the men who was driving one of the vehicles, one of the security captains, he was pissed with the police because he don't like the police and neither do we. So he asked him for his license and the brother took the license out of, his v out of the wallet and he just, just threw the license, just threw it. Threw it across the street, threw it out in the street. Brother, he made a he may have made an individual brave, rebellious act, but he put the whole goddamn mission in jeopardy. He put the whole mission in jeopardy because we on the way to Jasper to deal with the Klan and thousands of black people waiting in this big mission. But the whole thing is about to stop because we got one man in our ranks who could have just gave him the ID, checked it, and then we would have checked him and got on out of there. I was, as a lawyer, being prepared to challenge the rest of the stop and get us out of there. But when he just got pissed and went off, then you're setting up a scenario where the cop can say, well, you did something, you threw something, called for backup, a whole big mess could have uh, blew the whole mission with the whole world waiting and watching. So another example, it's not bad to deceive your enemy. If I'm goddamn stopped by the police and I know I just ran the red light. I mean, I ran straight through the light. I saw the light and ran through the damn light. I'm not cussing him out when he stopped me claiming pro racial profiling. And he don't even really know who I am. I'm like, sir, yes, sir, yes. And just rushing somewhere, sir. And I'm gone. Gave me back my license, no ticket. I'm gone. You can smile in their face and stab them in the back all damn day as far as I'm concerned. Make a noise in the east and strike in the west. Avoid these bastards and get right back to your revolutionary work if you can. Now, there are other times when you are not going to have that choice. There are other times when you are going to have to take take a stand and stand your ground. There are other times when you may have to use physical force to try to avoid it because the law is not on your side. Your main mission is to try to ease away from these bastards. All right, James Simmons. Thank you, Darlene. Thank you, Shabazz. Wake up, man. James Evans. All right, sir. Thank you for tuning in. Um, he may have his class members on. You know, brother, run the tape back. You should take this tape and run it back to your class. Take Make this the subject of your uh, uh, middle school class. I think it's middle school. Make them watch this. Have a discussion on the police. Have the discussion on why the police are called. Have this discussion. And let's make this a part of our culture. All of you who are under Professor James Muhammad, who was one of our teachers helping us here at Shabazz University, study this tape on police. Study this tape on 
police encounters and police training and why they are police, why they are police. Understand what happened to us when we came to America and how police brought here to contain us and to restrain us as slaves. To contain and to restrain us as slaves. They're wrong to contain and to restrain us as second class citizens. Now the police are here to protect and to serve what? White capitalism. To make sure that everything that the white man has stolen stays intact. That all of his property and his businesses and everything he owns, that it stays unmolested and nobody harms it and nobody gets un out of order. And that you stay contained within your poverty. So you stay contained within your reservations that they have confined us to that you are well policed and well behaved while you suffer oppression, economic degradation, and the ill effects of Jim Crow and slavery, welcome to policing. Now you be a good nigga and go by these rules is what society is teaching us. Let's come down here. Gerald Jackson, you're welcome, brother. I got plenty of good tips. Be patient with me. This is a class for law students. Do you know they don't even teach this in law school? Did you know you can go through three years of law and you can take constitutional law like I did and that you will really never know as a civilian or an attorney about police encounters? Do you realize that this is not taught at Howard University? It is not taught at Harvard University, but it's going to be taught at Shabazz University and God damn it, Pardon my language, because I said I would not use that in the university context. I will not use that word. I might use it when I'm preaching, but not when I'm teaching on this university. You will be able to learn it at Shabazz University School of Law and these law classes that we're teaching. Bobby Worthy. Now, this is, these are the subjects for me. Bobby Worthy says filing charges. I'm going to get into that. I'm going to get into you filing individual civil suits and to tie up the police. That's one of my subjects this summer. I'm going to go get into. Now, Bobby Worthy's a fan of filing, trying to file criminal charges, which is very difficult. But that does, that is approved under the theory of go after him in any way you can. So some of what Bobby Worthy does, I approve, even if it don't work. It costs them time and resources, and it make them think twice. The book, Shamanda, is on my email, attorney.shabazz at yahoo.com. If you email me, I'm going to email it back, and I'm going to put you all on our list. Students are hearing. I want you to hear it, and I want you students to hear this class from the top. What is the difference, Sister Darlene says, when a black man has a gun, it is a crime, but when white men have a gun, it's a right. And that's the difference in white law and black law. It is the difference between being white and black in America. I can show you case after case where the police say it's a high crime neighborhood and because the man, black, the man got out of the car and he looked suspicious. That was the basis for a stop. And in the eyes of the average white man, you are suspicious. And the law has a standard that we'll get into. It's called objective reasonableness. Meaning looking back on it, was the, cop, was the officer reasonable? Or was he unreasonable and racially profiling? Does he have protection? Is he immune from the lawsuit? Does he have what's called qualified immunity? And was he objectively reasonable, looking back at how he saw the situation at that time? And it's a big battle going on in court because they are not reasonable. They are policing from a racist mindset. The white man is not committing a crime and he's okay, but the black man is a criminal, according to the white police. Yet the white man represents a criminal system and society that has committed every crime that they are trying to arrest you for. 
I got probable cause to say you stole a grape out of a supermarket and I'm the white man. I stole the whole goddamn supermarket and I stole the land that the, that the grape was grown on to get to the market. Now this is what you must know and this will put a stop to crime. This is what a young man need to know on the battlefield out there to how to put a stop to crime and crime against black people and to know that from this day forward that we are soldiers and we ain't got but one enemy and that's white supremacy and a white ran police force and we're out here like combat soldiers. I'm coming out of my house. I'm a soldier. I'm getting in my car. I'm a soldier. Wherever I go, 24 hours a day, I'm a soldier in a war against white supremacy, white racism, and a white ran police system. And it's based on a criminal society and a society that has committed every crime that they would attempt to arrest me for. That's how every black man in America needs to be trained. Every mother that's raising a baby from suckling needs to know this and to put this knowledge into the suckling of her breast inside of that baby and we'll do it through Shabazz University we'll do it through these efforts and we'll teach one at a time until we change this mentality and this mindset I'm sorry for getting so emotional and I'm sorry for getting so passionate there are many questions and I can't ask them all please come back I'm gonna be on time next week I'm gonna have my videos inside of the screen and come back to the class. Know your rights and survive in police encounters. This is number two. Study class one and two. Go to ShabazzUniversity.com. Go to our YouTube channel. And for anyone else that wants to help, any administrator, any uh, 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 person that wants to help us with our university, come on and help. I'm willing to accept your help. And I'm going to keep right on here teaching. I am broke out with sweat up in here and the air conditioning going good here at my headquarters. But I'm determined to get this message across. My name is Malik Zulu Shabazz. I am the founder of Black Lawyers for Justice. I am an attorney that is fighting jail cases, police cases, false arrest cases, shooting cases. I am one of the lawyers who are out here in America fighting this problem. I am your brother and I am dedicated to giving to you what I know so that you may live and survive better. And we are ShabazzUniversity.com and we are Black Lawyers for Justice. God bless you to win this war against police brutality and police abuse. And remember, loose lips sink ships and discipline Discipline is the hallmark of success. Watch what you're saying, when you're saying, why you're saying it, and how you're saying it. Measure twice and cut once. Measure twice. Measure, think, analyze, reflect, then come out your mouth. Think, analyze before you act. Huh? When your woman say you nigga, you ain't nothing and you never had a job and you ain't even hitting the pussy right. Think before you go hitting that woman. Think. Measure twice. And cut the hell on out. Think, black woman, before you get upset at that man and you call the enemy of our people who will come and kill that man and may kill you and your children, and you add to the cycle of white supremacy. Think, measure twice, as I'm taught by my attorney, Donald Temple, my mentor. Measure twice, then make your move. Cut once. So much wisdom in this subject matter. I can't go on any longer. I have to leave because I got work to do. Please come back next week. Please attend my class. Please forgive me for my procedural errors and help me with Shabazz University. Help me with these technicals. Help me with this. And we will have what we have never had, an independent educational system to teach our own. And we are going to be accredited. 
we're going to get accredited where you can get your diploma, your degree, your certification, all of that. No more rhetoric and talking. It's time for action. God bless you. God bless you, man. Know your rights and justice for real, justice or else, and black power.